Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our briefing on the City of Philadelphia's response to COVID-19. Today, all of our speakers are joining the briefing virtually to adhere to social distancing guidelines. We will begin our briefing today with opening remarks from Mayor Jim Kenney. Mayor, you have the floor. Thanks, Kelly, and good afternoon to everyone. We all know that Philadelphia has built up a reputation for hosting spectacular events of all sizes, from neighborhood black parties and cultural festivals to the DNC, NFL draft, amongst many others. However, due to the ongoing public health crisis, the event landscape in our city is going to look very different for the foreseeable future. Today, I am really disappointed to announce that we will have a moratorium on large public events through February 28th, 2021. The city's Office of Special Events will not accept, review, process, or approve applications, issue permits, or enter into agreements for special events or public gatherings of 50 people or more on public property through the end of February. The moratorium will apply to special events and public gatherings, including but not limited to festivals, parades, concerts, carnivals, fairs, and flea markets. In addition, permit applications for residential block permits will not be accepted until further notice. A timeline when such activities may resume will be communicated as soon as possible. To be clear, this hold on large public events does not, does not apply to demonstrations and First Amendment protected activities, outdoor gatherings that are not publicly advertised, such as family picnics and outdoor weddings, group recreational activities for youth and adults with less than 25 participants, and events and gathering, gatherings taking place on private property, including performance venues and stadiums. For those gatherings that are allowed, event producers and venue managers must follow applicable guidance from the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I know this news will be disappointing for many Philadelphians. It was not an easy decision to make. But as we continue to battle COVID-19 and try to restore some sense of normalcy in our city, we know there will be many difficult decisions to come. The health and safety of Philadelphia residents workers and visitors must be our top priority. I look forward to celebrating with all of you at a block party or neighborhood festival once we get through this thing. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Farley for his update. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, case counts from the coronavirus infection continue to rise across the country and Pennsylvania. Uh, here in Philadelphia, our case counts in the past week have been stable uh, and we're trying to keep it that way. So here are the numbers. Uh, since this time yesterday, we've identified 148 new infections from the coronavirus uh, from in Philadelphia residents, bringing us to a total of 27,723 since the beginning of the epidemic. Now, last week, the week that ended on Saturday, we averaged about 107 cases per day. Now, there's some delay in hearing about cases, so that number will rise a little bit in the future. But it's very similar to the number that I reported this time last week. We're averaging about 5% of those people who were tested are positive, and that's also about where we were before. Uh, among those new cases, we're still seeing a predominance of people who are younger, young adults. Uh, about 40% of the people in the past few days uh, with this infection have been under the age of 30. That's compared to 20% for the epidemic as a whole. Since this time yesterday, we've identified six new deaths from the coronavirus infection, bringing us to a total of 1,637 since the beginning of the epidemic. Um, of those 834 or 51% were nursing home residents. Now those six deaths were re identified through matching with uh, databases and most of them have been in the past, but we're averaging about one new death per day. Uh, no death is acceptable, that's, but that's much lower than we were uh, some weeks ago. I haven't talked for a while about the racial distribution of deaths, uh, but we do know that this infection has uh, caused racial disparities and uh, the adverse outcome of uh, getting disease or mortality. Uh, so just here are the updated numbers on the racial disparities in uh, deaths. Uh, among people who died from this infection, 51% have been African-American, 27% white, 9% Hispanic, 4% Asian, uh, and 4% Asian. Now, if you divide that uh, uh, by the population and come up with a per capita mortality rate, the mortality rate among African-Americans is about 1.5 times that of whites, or to put it another way, about 50% higher than that of whites. I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. Uh, we've had problems with this epidemic uh, in clusters in congregate settings where people live together. I thought I'd give an update on that. Most of those clusters have been resolved. Uh, in nursing homes, for the most part, these infections have ended. Uh, we're averaging about one new infection per day 
in all of the nursing homes across the entire city. That's 46 different nursing homes. And mostly those infections are identified through screening of asymptomatic residents. Two thirds of our nursing homes, nursing homes have had no case in the past four weeks. And 15%, uh, an additional 15% that is, have had no cases in the past two weeks. So the nursing homes right now are looking very quiet and that's a good thing. The city's jail, uh, we had clusters in the past and we went weeks without any symptomatic cases. However, last week there was one uh, questionably symptomatic inmate uh, and because of the questionable symptoms that inmate was tested and found to be positive. Because of that, uh, they screened an additional 65 inmates in that unit and found 23 that had no symptoms uh, were positive. Now that positivity rate is higher than the 5% positivity rate among asymptomatic inmates for the entire jail through the facility-wide screening that is taking place. Uh, those inmates that were asymptomatic and positive have been isolated and infection control procedures are in place to try to contain that cluster in, in that unit. Uh, then I wanna update you on testing here in Philadelphia. We have testing available in 55 sites across the city. And the past week we averaged about 2,100 tests per day. And that's a number that's gradually increasing. Now we did hear reports last week uh, of long delays in people getting results. And so we looked at our data to try to understand that better. But overall, the average delay between when a person got their sample collected, when they got the result, or when we got the result was 1.3 days. That number isn't so bad. However, when we looked at the data more closely, we did see that there was a big difference in the delay for those getting negative results and those getting positive results for some laboratories. Now our local laboratories, such as the laboratories and hospitals, are taking one to two days on average to report out both negative results and positive results. But there are two big out-of-state laboratories, LabCorp and Quest, who are averaging one day to delay to report out negative results, but seven days delayed to report out positive results. Uh, and these two big laboratories do about one quarter of the tests here in Philadelphia. And the reason for that is that these two big laboratories are national laboratories and they are dealing with very, very high demand from other states where the epidemic is surging. Uh, this is nonetheless a problem for people who are being notified after seven days or more of their positive results. So they're people who are possibly infectious, but they don't know it during that time period. So our message to everyone right now is if you're tested, make sure that you isolate yourself and keep away from other people until you get your test results. Uh, it may be seven days or more until you get that result. And I know that that's inconvenient, that's difficult, but that's the safest thing to do until you get that test result. In the meantime, we'll see if it's possible, and I don't know if it is, if it's possible that we can the testing sites can redirect uh, their test samples to other laboratories that are having a quicker turnaround time. Now with the racial disparities in cases, there is an interest in what the access is to testing in, in people in different race groups across the city. In the past, we haven't been able to answer questions about that access to testing, uh, but uh, because the data on race for most of our negative lab test results was missing. Uh, but our people in the health department here have been able to match our databases with other databases and fill in that missing data on race uh, over time. Uh, and we'll be putting out a more detailed report uh, soon. But in the meantime, I thought I'd give you some of the top line numbers. Since the beginning of the epidemic, we've done 178,000 tests in Philadelphia residents. Uh, of those, for 20%, the race and ethnicity of the person tested is still not known. For 42%, uh, the person is African-American, 23% white, 7% Hispanic, and 3% Asian. Uh, so that does show that access to testing for the group that's most heavily affected African-Americans looks like it's approximately as good or, or better than those of whites. That's a good sign. If you want more information about testing uh, and how to get tested, just go to our website, www.phila.gov testing. Now, as I said, there are other areas of the country that are continuing to see rapid growth of the epidemic. This is particularly true in Florida and Arizona, Texas, uh, South Carolina, and Georgia, places that opened up early and that opened up, to my mind, recklessly. Um, initially, those sites were not seeing an increase in deaths, but they're now seeing increases in deaths. Cases are also increasing in Pennsylvania. Uh, in particular, there's an outbreak in Pittsburgh, uh, Allegheny County, and this counties nearby. Now here in Philadelphia, we have not seen the rapid increase in cases that have been seen elsewhere yet. Uh, but clearly from this evidence around the country, we are entering a dangerous period. Uh, the way for us to avoid similar increases without shutting down as we did before, is to have everyone follow the safety precautions. That includes most important, 
masks. Uh, wear your mask when you're around other people, indoors, outdoors. Uh, distancing, keeping six feet away from other people, and reducing crowds. Now, part of reducing crowds is we're recommending that people who can work from home continue to work from home. But because we have evidence that people are spreading this infection in social events, we're particularly recommending that people avoid social events, especially young adults where the virus seems to be spreading particularly right now. Now, we will be reinforcing our safety precautions to businesses and to individuals. The businesses, we are having staff from the health department and volunteers go door to door uh, to retail stores and give them flyers that describe all the safety precautions and posters uh, that tell people that masks are required in multiple languages. Uh, we've distributed so far about a thousand of those flyers and about 500 of these posters to stores around Philadelphia. And we'll continue to do that uh, indefinitely. To individuals, we have our media campaign on masks that we launched last week. The image that you see over my left shoulder is from that. Uh, everybody needs to look for that. Uh, it's, it should be on buses and other sites outdoors. It'll be on social media, it'll be in community newspapers uh, and we'll be have messages on the radio. Uh, the key message to everyone is to avoid a major shutdown. Uh, we need everyone to use masks when they're around others. Thanks a lot. Uh, for more information, go to www.phila.gov slash COVID. Thank you, Dr. Farley. We are now going to turn it over to Armando for the Spanish language translation of both the mayor and Dr. Farley's remarks. Palabras del alcalde Jim Kenny para el martes 14 de julio del 2020. Buenas tardes. Todos sabemos que Filadelfia tiene una gran reputación por albergar eventos espectaculares de todo tamaño, desde fiestas en las comunidades, festivales culturales, hasta la Convención Demócrata Nacional, el draft de la NFL e incluso el Encuentro Mundial de Familias con el Papa. Sin embargo, debido a la actual crisis de salud pública, el panorama de eventos en nuestra ciudad será muy diferente en el futuro previsible. Hoy, me da pena anunciar que tendremos una moratoria a los grandes eventos públicos hasta el 28 de febrero del 2021. La Oficina de Eventos Especiales de la Ciudad no va a aceptar, ni revisar, ni procesar o aprobar solicitudes. Tampoco emitirá permisos ni celebrará acuerdos para eventos especiales o reuniones públicas de 50 o más personas en propiedad pública hasta fines de febrero. La moratoria comprende eventos especiales y reuniones públicas que incluyen, entre otros, festivales, desfiles, conciertos, carnavales, ferias y mercadillos comúnmente conocidos como los mercados de las pulgas. Además, las solicitudes de permisos para fiestas residenciales o block parties no se aceptarán hasta un nuevo aviso. Para que nos quede a todos claro, esta moratoria para grandes eventos públicos no incluye las protestas y actividades protegidas por la primera, primera enmienda de la Constitución, las reuniones al aire libre que no se anuncien públicamente como picnics familiares y bodas al aire libre, las actividades recreativas grupales al aire libre para jóvenes y adultos con menos de 25 participantes y los eventos y reuniones que tienen lugar en propiedad privada, incluyendo los estadios. Para aquellas reuniones que están permitidas, los productores de eventos y los gerentes de los locales deben seguir las pautas del Departamento de Salud Pública de Filadelfia y de la Mancomunidad de Pensilvania. Sé que esta noticia será decepcionante para muchos habitantes de Filadelfia. No ha sido una decisión fácil de tomar. Pero a medida que continuamos luchando contra la COVID-19 y tratamos de restaurar una cierta sensación de normalidad en nuestra ciudad, sabemos que todavía habrá muchas decisiones difíciles más adelante. La salud y la seguridad de los residentes, trabajadores y visitantes de Filadelfia debe ser nuestra primera prioridad. Y espero celebrar con todos ustedes en sus comunidades una vez que pase todo esto. Esta es la actualización en materia de salud para el martes 14 de julio del 2020. Los casos continúan aumentando a nivel nacional y también en Pensilvania. En Filadelfia, el reporte de casos se encuentra estable desde la semana pasada. Se han reportado 148 nuevos casos con un total de 27,723 casos acumulados. En promedio, hemos tenido 107 casos diarios durante la última semana. Aproximadamente el 5% del total de pruebas realizadas han dado resultados positivos. El número mayor de casos se ha registrado entre los jóvenes. El 40% de los nuevos casos se han reportado en menores de 30 años de edad. Y hoy, lamentablemente, reportamos seis nuevos fallecimientos por la COVID-19 en Filadelfia. El total acumulado de muertes por la COVID-19 
es 1,637. 834 de estas muertes se registraron en hogares de ancianos y representan un 51% del total. En promedio, podemos decir que se registra una muerte diaria por la COVID-19. Y hay disparidades raciales en las muertes a raíz del COVID-19. El 51% de ellas son de afroamericanos. 27% de estas muertes son de blancos, un 9% entre los hispanos o latinos y un 4% entre los asiáticos. Los casos en los entornos congregados están prácticamente controlados. En los hogares de ancianos se han registrado muy pocos casos. Y en promedio se ha registrado un caso diario en todas las instalaciones de la ciudad, mayormente detectado entre las pruebas a pacientes asintomáticos. Respecto a las cárceles, hemos tenido semanas ya sin reportar casos nuevos. La semana pasada, un recluso con síntomas dio positivo a la prueba. Las pruebas en 65 reclusos sin síntomas dieron a 23 personas positivas para el virus. Los reclusos fueron puestos en aislamiento y la infección fue controlada en esa unidad. Con relación a la disponibilidad de las pruebas, tenemos 55 centros de pruebas disponibles. El promedio de las pruebas diarias es de 2,100 pruebas cada día. Lamentablemente, también debemos reconocer que hay retrasos para obtener los resultados. Estamos revisando nuestros datos provenientes de la semana pasada. En promedio, el retraso es de un día para la recolección de datos. Hay, sin embargo, una gran diferencia entre el reporte de los casos positivos y los negativos en algunos laboratorios. En los laboratorios locales, el promedio para el reporte de casos tanto positivos como negativos es de uno o dos días. En los laboratorios más grandes, como la Corp y Quest, los casos negativos toman un día en reportarse, pero los casos positivos se demoran alrededor de siete días. Estos laboratorios realizan un cuarto del total de las pruebas en nuestra región. El problema de notificar los casos tardíamente es que puede haber brotes posibles que sean infecciosos de los cuales no tenemos conocimiento aún y el rastreo de contactos, por lo tanto, se hace muy difícil. Un mensaje para todas las personas que se hacen las pruebas es, por favor, mantenerse aislados en la medida de lo posible hasta recibir sus resultados. Y esto puede tomar hasta siete días. Con todas las disparidades raciales en los casos, hay un gran interés de las personas en obtener los resultados de las pruebas en base a la raza. Los datos en referencia a la raza de los casos con resultados negativos no estuvo disponible en el pasado, pero hemos sido capaces de obtener esos datos ahora. Y compartiremos en el futuro estos datos en un informe más detallado, pero los más importantes por ahora son cerca de 178 mil pruebas se han realizado desde que se inició la epidemia. El 20% no encuentra disponible la raza o la etnia de los examinados. 42% de ellos han sido afroamericanos, 23% blancos, 7% hispanos o latinos y 3% asiáticos. Volviendo al tema de la evolución de la pandemia en los Estados Unidos, debemos decir que los casos se están incrementando rápidamente, particularmente en la Florida, Arizona y Texas. Inicialmente, en esta segunda ola, no se reportaron tantas muertes, pero debido al retraso en el cruce de, con las bases de datos, esos números sí se están incrementando. Los casos están aumentando también en Pensilvania. Hubo un repunte en el condado de Allegheny y en los condados vecinos. No hemos visto un aumento desmesurado de los casos aquí todavía, pero estamos entrando en una fase peligrosa. Para prevenir una situación similar a la de los estados ya mencionados, sin tener que suspender totalmente nuestras operaciones comerciales, debemos demostrar un alto nivel de cumplimiento con las precauciones de seguridad. Y esto se logra mediante el uso universal de mascarillas o tapabocas por orden de la ciudad y del Estado, el mantener la distancia social y el lograr un control de multitudes. La recomendación para las personas que pueden trabajar desde casa es que continúen haciéndolo. Hay otra recomendación importante y es que los jóvenes, especialmente, eviten las reuniones y eventos sociales. También estamos insistiendo en la instalación de barreras de plexiglas en los comercios. El Departamento de Salud de Filadelfia, junto con sus voluntarios, están distribuyendo volantes con información sobre esas directrices en las tiendas y negocios. Por favor, recordemos usar la máscara al salir de casa. La campaña Usa tu máscara continúa y está muy cerca de ustedes. La ven en los autobuses, en los espacios abiertos, en la radio y en los periódicos comunitarios. Quiere a tus vecinos, 
Gira tu ciudad de Filadelfia. Usa tu máscara. Gracias. Thank you so much, Armando. We will now move to the Q&A portion for members of the media logged in today. Please limit your questions to topics related to the COVID-19 pandemic. If time permits, we will open the floor later to other topics. So if your hand is raised now for another topic, please lower it and we will try to get to that later. Please remember we do have limited time during these briefings, so only one representative from each media outlet is permitted to ask questions and reporters are asked to limit their questions to three or fewer. We will do a second round of questions if time permits. So for those logged in today, please use the raise your hand feature. It can be found under the participants list. We also ask that you use video to ask your question if you are able for broadcasting purposes. We will now uh, unmute reporters one by one to ask their questions, starting with Jeff Cole of Fox 29. Yeah, hi there. Um, I'm sorry, when I uh, alerted the mayor's office, I wanted to talk to Brian. They said he would be on this call and I need to ask him some questions. So my questions are for Brian. Brian, uh, on a budget, a city council budget meeting, you said that you were dumbfounded at how out of touch you truly were about the unrest in the city in late May and that you under, underestimated the anger and the rage that was shown on that Saturday in late May. Have you had a chance to focus on that and understand now why you didn't get the anger and rage that was there? So, Jeff, I'm happy to address your questions, but I think we should get, uh, get through the COVID questions first, uh, but happy to... Happy to, to address that specifically as after we get through the health department questions. Jeff, we're gonna move on. Um, if you have any other COVID questions, please raise your hand, but we are gonna to stick to the COVID-19 pandemic questions. We're gonna to go to Mitch um, Blocker of NBC10. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can you talk a little bit about how the city's financial situation played into the decision to not have large events uh, in terms of uh, staffing or, or any of the financial difficulties in the city's <laughs> dealing with? Certainly everything, you know, is seen through the lens of what, it, what it's going to cost. But from my perspective, it is more to have to, it more has to do with what Dr. Farley thinks is safe for us. Um, certainly uh, not having these events, uh, however disappointing they are, will save the city some overtime, mostly overtime in police and uh, other city employees. Uh, but um, I think what we are doing here is following medical advice, which I think every city and state in the nation should have, uh, and we wouldn't be in the situation that we see resurging. So to bring people together in large groups uh, in this uh, resurgent time uh, would not be would not be responsible, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. What do you expect, uh, short term and then long term, uh, financially, uh, the economic impact in the city, uh, as as you see other cities? that are having to shut down who had their economies open. We obviously were not having our economy open. Is the, can you talk a little bit about the short-term impact well, and then what you hope the long-term our, impact will be? Our, our finance folks and our government generally did a very good job uh, in building up a fund balance that was the highest in the city's history. That set aside money in a rainy day fund. Uh, uh, first time in, in, since that legislation was passed and I sponsored it about 15 years ago. Uh, we had money set aside for a, uh, for our uh, employee contracts and set aside for a downturn in the economy. Uh, all that money went basically in two, three months, uh, but thank God we had it because we, we weren't as down as we could have been if we were uh, not uh, financially stable to begin with. Uh, short, we're gonna see some additional tax numbers coming in uh, shortly and we'll be able to uh, project where we will or will not be uh, and we'll, we'll accordingly make adjustments. Uh, hopefully we start to level off and start to build back. Uh, but as long as we're in somewhat of a kind of a shutdown phase um, or not in full open phase, uh, it's going to make it difficult to generate revenue uh, and we'll do our best. And hopefully uh, at some point in time, we get a new president and a new United States Senate uh, majority. Uh, we'll have some help coming from Washington for some of our, our revenue, uh, re revenue replacement money uh, that we've lost. And, and one last question, sir, uh, and Dr. Farley, I'd love your thoughts as well. Um, how, how will this move uh, with, with not having these large events over 50 people? Um, how will it uh, affect the city's ability to continue in its modified green phase? Uh, might, it, might it 
make it so that we don't have a spike and, and we don't have to necessarily roll back into a yellow phase? That's our hope, but I'll let Dr. Farley exact. Um... Uh, I, I think that the bigger lesson right now is that uh, we're gonna have to live with this virus for a long time. It's not just gonna go away. I think the states that uh, open up early uh, somehow thought it was magically going to go away. Uh, and so uh, we're gonna have to have some restrictions on our activities until we deploy a vaccine. Uh, that's gonna be some period of time. Uh, and so this is just one piece of that overall uh, strategy and how to, how to survive uh, and, and do the best we can uh, until we have that vaccine. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, Mitch. We're going to go to Chad Perdelli with 6ABC. Yeah, this is for the mayor or the, uh, I guess this is for the mayor. How are you going to enforce um, this moratorium? What are some of the fines and penalties if, if you know, someone puts on a festival or so forth? Um, I mean, you talk about, what, give me an example of an event that would go on without so say uh, in, the, in South Philadelphia, they decide to have a festival regardless of a permit or anything. And do you, do you foresee that maybe happening? And would that be a problem? It uh, would be a problem for everyone participating in the event from their health. Right. Um, and I think that would be dumb to do. Uh, we would certainly interact with them and you try to convince them not to do that. I, you, you, I can't speculate on, on, a, on an event. I don't know what it is, the number of people, uh, you know, what's going on. Uh, we'd have to take it on a case by case basis, uh, but um, we would we would encourage people not to. Uh, we would encourage people to be smart and not unsmart, uh, and don't do these things. And, and the only thing I would add, I, I do want to add something, Chad, is mm -hmm. you know, when we look at events, um, most of those are planned well in advance, months in advance, and they work with our office of special events uh, in order to do that. Um, and those are the events that we're talking about. I, I don't expect this to be a challenge or a problem uh, with event producers. I think they understand the risks uh, and we have great relationships with those producers uh, and, and expect to, I don't think we're gonna have to you know, enforce like you're, like you're envisioning. And for Dr. Farley, obviously there's a lot of questions surrounding you know, the NFL, the Eagles, uh, the stadium. Um, at any point in your mind as, you know, the health commissioner, what are your thoughts on football being played, you know, at the link? And what would your recommendation there be? So we, we have seen uh, protocols for all the major sports leagues and all of their protocols look pretty good. Uh, I do think that games can be played uh, with the kind of safety precautions that they're proposing. Uh, I do not think uh, that they can have spectators at those games. There's no way for them to be safe to have a big crowd there. Uh, and so uh, I can't say what, what the plans are for the league, uh, but I, again, that's, I think, from a safety perspective, they can play games, but not uh, with crowds. And that would also include tailgating or anything of, of that sort, uh, if Absolutely. there is an NFL yes. season? Yes. That's it for COVID. I do have a question for a colleague, for Brian, but I guess I'll wait on that. Sure, man. Uh, we'll come back, Chad. Okay. Thank you. Going to Sean Walsh now of the Inquirer. Thanks very much. I'll hold for the second round as well. Okay. Um, Shaira uh, Arias of NBC 10 Telemundo. Are you done? Hi, yes, so no, I'll be holding for the second round as well. Yo voy a esperar a la segunda ronda. Okay, just a reminder, if you do have your hand raised right now, just um, if you could please just lower that and we'll get to the second round, but we still want to take questions just on COVID right now. Jack Tomsick now of Metro. Uh, yes, this question uh, is either for Dr. Farley or the mayor. Well, how did you guys uh, get to the six month mark? What was the what, what what was the thinking to get into canceling all large events for that period of time? Doctor, uh, you know it takes a long time to schedule and plan these sorts of events. Uh, and we want to make sure that people uh, are you know there, there's clarity to that. I know that's disappointing to people, uh, but we're certainly not going to be um, deploying a vaccine and be free of this virus um, in January. It, we would be lucky if we were starting to deploy at that time. So uh, this is the safe way to give clarity to people. We don't expect we're going to be able to have these events uh, through, through February. 
And I know you said before that you were hopeful that a vaccine could be deployed or early in the year. And I know you said it would take time to do that. Are you still hopeful that it's possible that a vaccine would be rolled out uh, beginning it early in the year? Well, I said, I think that the, the vaccine will be deployed sometime in 2021. Um, mm -hmm. I hope it's earlier in 2021, not later 2021. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it would be uh, very unlikely that we're going to be um, putting a vaccine out in January. I think it's more likely it's going to be sometime during the year. All right. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks, Jack. Uh, we're going next to Matt Petrillo of CBS3. Hi there. Um, Philadelphia didn't cancel a parade during the 1918 pandemic, uh, Dr. Farley, and those results were devastating. Did your decision uh, on, on this on these on this moratorium have anything to do with that? I think that that um, the, the failure to cancel that parade way back in 1918 is still in the memory of everybody in public health. Uh, that weighs on all of our decisions. Uh, that, you know, the whole idea behind canceling big events and an epidemic like this uh, makes a lot of sense and you, because you, we have that example. Uh, and so, uh, so yes in the future, but yes uh, as far as what we've done up until this point. Matt, did you have any further questions? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, wasn't letting me unmute. Um, oh. uh, it, it's COVID related, just about trash backups. If this question's okay, we, we're just wondering what's leading to all these backups and how the department, if they're planning to better handle this, how they're doing that? Sure, uh, the this delays in sanitation are still directly related to um, attendance. Um, you know, as we moved to collect full collection uh, and weekly collection of recycling last week, we were also hit with some significant uh, storms that, that put us back on our heels a little bit. Uh, sanitation, our streets department is certainly working uh, to address those issues uh, proactively uh, and hope uh, that uh, this week's step of going on a holiday schedule should allow them to catch up uh, and that we'll be back to normal uh, next week. Uh, at least that's the hope. All right, thank you. All good. Thank you. Next up, we have um, Max Marin of Billy Penn. Hi, a uh, question for Dr. Farley. If you could repeat the numbers earlier about the outbreak in the prison system, you were moving quite quickly through them and I don't see those numbers online right now. I'm sorry, I, I had trouble hearing your question. Could you speak up a little bit? Could you repeat the numbers about the outbreak in the prison system? Yeah, so there was uh, one inmate who uh, was questionably symptomatic uh, and tested positive. Uh, in the wake of that, then they screened 65 additional asymptomatic inmates, no symptoms, and they found 23 of them were positive. Um, that inmate, I'm told, was uh, identified last Tuesday. Why did the city wait so long to disclose this? Uh, you know, I, they, the, I think the data might have been our website, but, um, you know, we, we only have this twice a week, so we didn't talk about it on Thursday. We have the numbers probably collected on Friday, so this is our first press release since then. Um, is there uh, a reason why uh, the positive results take longer than the negative results uh, in general for the COVID testing for the labs to come back? No, we, uh, we figured this out this morning and so we'll have to talk to the laboratories. I can only guess that they do some sort of screening test first. Uh, and if it's clearly negative, then they feel comfortable saying it's negative. If it doesn't pass that screening test and they need to do additional tests to prove that it's positive and there's a bottleneck at those additional tests. Um, and just one additional question about the isolation uh, at the prison system. Are the 65 inmates who are, who are have now been isolated, are they, have they been given private rooms or are they still cohabitating in the same cells? Uh, we'll have to get back on their, their exact procedures. Okay, that's all for COVID. Thank you. So Max, we're going to go now to Denise Clay of the Sunday Sun. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I guess my first question is, now that you've told, now that you know it's been announced that the city is not gonna have any large gatherings for the next six months, have you spoken to the organizations that usually put these gatherings together and what kind of response have they given you? Hey, yes, we have actually spoken to the majority of the event producers. Um, you know, I don't think they were surprised um, by uh, the city's position and, and uh, I'd say some of them were relieved. 
Uh, I think I think every responsible organizer uh, understands the challenges that both the city is facing, our country is facing, uh, and they want to do the right thing. Uh, I think none of us uh, are happy about the event cancellations, um, but I think we all recognize it's the right thing to do for our public health. Okay, my second question revolves around enforcement of you know, the, the mask requirements and, and different things when it comes to not only retail, but also large gatherings. Um, oh, around the country, you've had people have literally have their lives threatened by trying to enforce mask requirements. And also, and I don't know if you, I don't know how much internet you all participate in, but there's this video going around of a rather large party in Southwest Philadelphia, which included some twerking and a Philadelphia police officer. So, you know, seeing as large group gatherings are, are, are a vector for the virus, has the city, you know, changed its mind about maybe, you know, inf- you know, getting some fines together, you know, issuing some tickets, something, because it's obvious that people are not doing what you ask them on their own. Most, most people are doing what we asked on their, on their own. And we are in a very critical situation and a very sensitive situation right now when it comes to police and community relations and interaction. Uh, and while I don't like to see that large gathering, uh, and I think people are being foolish by putting themselves in medical harm's way, I think that this, can, this situation that we're in right now, and we've been in for the past number of months, or at least the last month for sure, uh, would not... Um, Call for a large-scale police action of the neighborhood party. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks, Denise. Okay, we are going to go back to Jeff Cole at Fox 29. <coughs> okay, again, uh, for Brian. Brian, you heard the partial of what I was going to ask you. You had said you were dumbfounded and at how out of touch you were uh, at the uh, unrest of late May. And you suggested that you had underestimated the anger and the rage that was seen on that Saturday in the city when cars were burning and looting occurred. Have you looked at that and figured out why it is you did not, why you underestimated this? I I think um, city officials uh, from across the country underestimated the what we were going to see on May 30th and June 1st. Uh, I don't think I was alone. And if you look at the rest of my remarks, I think I, I, I make that clear. And it was really trying to make a point that it was a t- moment in time for us all to be self-reflective and to question where we are uh, in society and what our role is uh, as a whole. Uh, and that was that was the intent of those remarks uh, is to, to really be thoughtful about uh, about what our position is today. Uh, and and I, I continue to stand by them. Um, you know, I, I've been very proud of the work that I've done uh, for this city, uh, and I'm leaving uh, with my head high, uh, appreciative of that work and appreciating the mayor uh, giving me the opportunity to serve. Uh, but it's time, it's time for me to move on. Uh, it's time for, uh, and it's time for uh, other voices to be heard at the table. Uh, to have uh, additional diversity and d- additional perspectives. So, but but in look, I, I understand that others made the same mistakes or it, it underestimated in what you said. But as you've looked at that and and realized that maybe you underestimated it, um, is that some of the reason why you think it's now time to step away? I think our country and our city is facing a moment in time uh, that's very unique in our history. Uh, and that uh, allows for great change to occur. Uh, and uh, so I think the short answer is, you know, I'm leaving for, for a few different reasons. One is um, the last few months have been incredibly challenging for myself and my family. Uh, and, uh, and it's been incredible burdens uh, as we have led the city through the pandemic. And I'm proud of that work. Um, but I also agree uh, that it's important, uh, again, to broaden uh, the table, broaden the decision making. And, you know, frankly, I hope the next managing director is an African American uh, and maybe even an African American woman, uh, because I think it is important uh, for this city uh, to really uh, to turn the corner. We have deep racial divides here. Uh, I am painfully aware of that. Uh, I'm also painfully aware that I can't put myself in the shoes of some of the few folks I serve. 
uh, because I've been born with privileges that uh, frankly are unfair. Uh, those are the privileges I'm, I've been fighting my entire career to make sure I provide to the rest of our, uh, the rest of our city. Uh, but I, I am not naive and, uh, and look forward to, to uh, the city's future. I have one more question. I've asked this at another event as well and, didn't, and wasn't able to get an answer. Once again, the reporting is that on the day of the major unrest in late May, there was the full complement of police officers, including bike cops, were assigned that day, or at least the plan included that. But then a decision was made by some city official to limit the number of police officers on the street that Saturday. Did you make that decision and why? There was no, to my knowledge, there was no city uh, official that asked the police department to change its operating plans. I did not do that. My deputy did not do that. The mayor did not do that. The uh, planning for, poli uh, for police operations are done by police. I have never and will never interfere with those plans. And there, so there was no movement by anybody to limit the number of police, to, to reduce the number of police that were first assigned that day? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. We're gonna to go to um, Victor Fiorello who had a COVID question. Hi, good afternoon. So I understand the moratorium and its application to um, public events. I'm just a little bit confused about the language where it says it does not apply to events at stadiums. So does this mean that you could ha have a large scale event at a stadium, at a large theater, um, thinking of everything from the link to say the Fillmore? Uh, can you explain exactly what the rules are regarding large events at venues like stadiums? Sure. I think the effort of the press release, maybe it wasn't uh, as artfully crafted as, as we intended it to be, was to essentially say that, um, you know, uh, the Eagles are still going to be allowed to play, although without without crowds. The Phillies will continue to be allowed to play, uh, although without crowds. Um, those are special events that the, uh, uh, that the city wouldn't permit on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, and wouldn't expect to happen. And, and similarly, private events that would be held at, say, the Fillmore uh, is also something that we wouldn't prohibit, although our current health guidelines uh, would prohibit it uh, in, in other ways. So I think we are trying to, to uh, do our best to, to make that clear, and, and apologies if, if we weren't able to uh, do that. Hi, yes, thanks. Sorry, so regarding those health requirements that are in place right now, if an event at the Fillmore did want to go on a concert, let's say, uh, with are they able to do it with half capacity? What are the current no. regarding that? So we're not permitting events of 25 or more people indoors. Okay, 25. Okay, thank you. And, and so, and uh, theaters are still to be closed under the current executive order, regardless of the size of the population. Theaters Outdoor are... events, nobody more than 50. Right, so back to that point, you said theaters are supposed to be closed or they just simply can't have audiences of more than 25 people? They're closed. Okay, great. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to Shaira Arias. Okay. Hi, eh, Armando. Okay. No te, no estás apareciendo la pantalla, pero eh, me escuchas, ¿verdad? Perfectamente. Okay. Eh, por favor, explícale a Brian Abernathy, ¿verdad? Que yo entiendo que ya él explicó más o menos en inglés, pero esto es para poder explicárselo a nuestros televidentes en español. Que no disculpe que él se tenga que volver a repetir, pero queremos aclarar que parte de la decisión de su renuncia eh, tiene algo que ver con las decisiones que se tomaron cuando eh, se colocó cierta cantidad de oficiales de la policía eh, para proteger lo que viene siendo la alcaldía, el edificio municipal, que si, qué, qué tan involucrado él estuvo en esas decisiones y si eso tiene que ver con su renuncia. This question is for Brian, and Brian, this question has been asked already in English, but this is for the benefit of the Spanish-speaking audience. And the question is whether your resignation is a reflection that you're assuming responsibility for the decision of placing so many police officers in the vicinity of of deploying them in commercial areas where I'm protected. How involved were you in the making of this decision? Um, no, it does not reflect uh, reflect any decisions uh, related to the police department deployment. Uh, those decisions uh, are made by police department leadership. 
no, no refleja ninguna decisión que haya tomado yo con respecto a cómo se pusieron los oficiales de policía ese día, esa decisión queda con el departamento de policía. Me imagino que esto también eh, va pasado, eh, catalogado con la decisión que se tomó o eh, cómo se manejó las protestas cuando se vieron en la 676 del uso de gas lagrimógeno, si él tuvo algo que ver con decisiones que se tomaron allí o si él, siente, si él se siente conectado, le puedes preguntar con esas decisiones que se tomaron allí, cómo él se, afect, se siente afectado por lo que, lo que se vio ese día. Uh, this is a follow-up question related to the same topic in a way, which is uh, what were your participation and how you felt affected? How were you connected with the decision of uh, having uh, the tear gas on protesters back in June on 676? Um, so uh, the um, permission to allow uh, tear gas at, at any event um, uh, was uh, permitted um, by a number of us. Uh, across uh, across city government. Uh, the specific deployment on 676 uh, was authorized by incident commanders uh, of the police department on the ground. Uh, and I think uh, both the mayor and Commissioner Outlaw have addressed those issues in detail. I think that's totally, totally, totally accurate in that, yes, they, the police asked to have the availability of, of the tear gas in the event of, of its need. Uh, that was authorized, but the use of it was authorized on the on the street by the incident commanders. Um, uh, it was not authorized by Brian Abernathy or myself directly in that incident, or anyone else in the in the emergency in the emergency center. Um, and um, and you know it is what it is, and we will uh, review how we reacted. But the one thing I want to say and correct what, what what was wrong. But I, the one thing I will say is is that. You know, we have like 6,300 or so sworn officers. What was going on those two days and nights um, where it was, was an amazing, uh, amazing thing that caught everybody by surprise, to tell you the truth, across the country. Uh, the, the, the level of anger and the level of explosion that took place, we could have never, we'd never had enough police to go to every single location that was requested when it came to looting or anything else like that. Um, so, I mean, if you look at New York City, for example, they have 40,000 police officers and Fifth Avenue was looted. So, I mean, it's it's not as if, you know, we had 40,000 police, which we never could ever have and afford to have, uh, you know, you can control all that. Uh, so everyone did their best, uh, certainly uh, from the armchair on Monday morning, it's it's easy to, to criticize uh, and people have a right to criticize if they choose. Uh, but this, this, was a, this was real time stuff and life and death decisions that had to be made uh, and uh, we did our best. Bien, la respuesta es eh, el permiso para permitir el uso del gas lacrimógeno para cualquier evento se permitió, pero un número de nosotros en el gobierno municipal no tuvimos eh, la decisión específica porque eso le pertenece a los comandantes de la policía. Ellos, eh, esto ya se lo ha explicado el alcalde, así mismo como la comisionada Outlaw, y obviamente nosotros tenemos... Uh, el permiso que se otorgó, porque la policía nos pidió si había permiso para tener el gas lacrimógeno. Pero en cuanto al uso del gas lacrimógeno, eso quedó con los oficiales que estaban en el campo y tuvieron que resolver eso en ese momento. Ni Brian ni yo, nos agrega el alcalde, hemos tomado decisiones en ese sentido desde nuestro centro de emergencia y es lo que es, es lo que sucedió. Y lo que nosotros tenemos que recalcar es que hubiera sido imposible porque nosotros tenemos 6.300 oficiales de policía desplegarlos en todos los negocios y las áreas vulnerables. Fueron dos días de protestas y esto nos sorprendió a nosotros tanto en la ciudad como las protestas sorprendieron a todos a nivel nacional. Hubo una explosión de la cólera y la ira de las personas y nunca hubiéramos tenido suficiente personal policial para proteger todas las áreas comerciales que fueron vulnerables como por ejemplo eh, lo que sucedió en Nueva York, donde tenían a 40.000 policías, sin embargo, pese a ello, hubo disturbios y saqueos en la quinta avenida misma. Entonces nosotros teníamos que hacer lo mejor que podíamos en ese momento para controlar la situación. Todas las personas hicieron su mejor esfuerzo y fueron cosas que tuvieron que hacerse en ese momento en tiempo real. Es muy fácil criticar y analizar tras los hechos, pero creemos que hicimos un buen trabajo en ese sentido. Gracias. Y por último, para el alcalde, eh, si él pudiera decir unas cuantas palabras, ¿qué opina él sobre el trabajo que ha hecho Brian Abernathy? ¿Cómo se siente de que su mano derecha está renunciando en un momento 
eh, de tanta controversia donde eh, varios titulares lo que dicen es que es bajo la presión de decisiones que se tomaron durante este civil unrest. ¿Cuál es su opinión de que esto está sucediendo después de esto? And this question is from Mayor Caney. Mayor Caney, what's your opinion on Brian Sabernathy's performance and the decision of resigning, which is coming now in the midst of controversy? The press is saying that maybe this is due to the pressure over the decisions that were made during the days of public protests. Well, the press will be wrong about that decision. Uh, they or their speculation, anonymous speculation, which is pretty much worthless unless people are willing to say who they are when they're speculating. Uh, but when I look back at Brian's tenure, Uh, in this administration um, for, you know, drastically helping to reduce pedestrian stops in a, with our police department, uh, decarcerating our, our prison system, actually closing a prison, uh, honchoing rebuild, which is a large construction and design process, uh, helping us guide us through COVID-19 uh, uh, and dealing with the civil unrest is the best we all could. Um, I think he's done an outstanding job, but I think the mutual decision that he and I have made is that for his For his well-being, I mean, it's a hard job, and you're on call 24 hours, seven days a week uh, for the past 19 months, uh, and even before that, when he was first deputy, uh, it takes a toll. I'm 62 years old. I have my family's grown. He has two. He has young kids, uh, and a wife who has to bear the burden of some of the stuff he'd be doing around the house if he was home instead of working for the taxpayers and, and the city of Philadelphia. So this is a, a decision we came to. I, I think he's terrific, and wish him well. Uh, and um, I think he's done a great job here. Uh, and uh, it, none of this decision had to do with anything that's happened in the last month. Eh, yo pienso de que la decisión no tiene que ver con la especulación que está haciendo la prensa, especialmente la prensa anónima, que está equivocada y cuya opinión no vale nada. El tiempo que Brian ha estado sirviendo a la ciudad ha servido para lograr muchas cosas específicas y buenas. Ha ayudado a reducir el número de detenciones a los peatones, ha logrado lograr sacar gente de las cárceles, cerrar una prisión en realidad, nos ha ayudado con el diseño en el proceso de otra, ha ayudado a enfrentar la crisis del COVID-19 en la ciudad y enfrentar las protestas ciudadanas que se han dado y creo yo que ha hecho un trabajo excelente y remarcable. Esto ha sido una decisión mutua que hemos tomado él y yo, él ha estado trabajando 14 meses en este puesto y antes como el primer secretario de administración en la ciudad. Yo tengo 62 años de edad. Brian tiene una familia joven con niños y una esposa que han tenido que sacrificarse esperando que él pudiera atender a estas emergencias 24 horas al día, 7 días por semana. Y esa carga es una carga muy grande que no puede sostenerse en el tiempo. La decisión ha sido mutua y es una decisión en la cual hemos tomado con mucho eh, detenimiento. Creo yo que su desempeño ha sido fantástico. Creo de que le deseo lo mejor en su futuro. Creo que él ha hecho un gran trabajo para la ciudad y le agradecemos por ello. Thank you. Gracias, hermano. Por nada, Shaira. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, we do have a number of folks with their hands still raised, so we would just like to ask that if you could limit it to your two most important questions so we can try to get to everyone before our time limit. We're going to go to David um, Melandra Jr. of the Philly Sports Network. Okay, so my question is for Dr. Farley and for Mayor Kenny. I just want to follow up what Chad said earlier. First off, you're saying for the Eagles and for Temple University to play their football games at the link this year, they can play but with no fans. I just want to make sure I understood that. Well, what I said is that I reviewed the, or my department has reviewed the protocols of the professional sports teams, and we haven't reviewed the protocols of the college teams. And uh, we do think that they can operate uh, if they follow those protocols safely. Uh, nothing specific about the Lincoln, but certainly if they do, there would not be any uh, fans. David, did you have an additional question? Yes, and my follow-up question for that would be, so for the 2020 season, you don't expect any fans to be in the stadiums for this year. Do you expect them to come back in 2021? Uh, I think that's too far out to speculate now. Okay. David, did you have any other additional questions? Okay. 
We're going to go to Sean Walsh now of the Inquirer. Thanks very much. Um, Mayor, I know you just said that uh, this decision had nothing to do with the previous month and you guys made it together. Um, but Brian, two weeks ago, you said that you had no plans to leave the administration anytime soon. Um, and Mayor, you said you thought he was doing a good job. It seems like something must have happened more recently that, that had a change, that made you have a change of heart here. And it does appear, given the facts, that this was your decision primarily, Mayor. Could you no, it was a mutual decision, and we had a discussion about it um, over a period of a couple of weeks. Uh, and this is what we came. This is the decision we came to. And any other speculation is not accurate. What, what prompted the discussion then? If um, we talk all the Brian time, we, you, we, we, we talk all the time. We talk every day, sometimes a couple of times a day. So we've had discussions, and this seemed to be the best path for for him. Um, and is there thought to who may be Brian's successor? Yeah. We'll probably do a search. And uh, lastly, a coronavirus question. Just clarifying the, the sports stadium thing, Dr. Farley. Uh, is the city, let, let's say the Eagles wanted to have fans <clears throat> this year, hypothetically. Are you guys, with this part of this announcement, banning that from happening? Yeah, having fans in the stadium uh, would not meet our uh, executive order, would not meet our guidelines, so no. Okay. And, and just to clarify, Sean, we have been in communication with the Eagles. We have told them our expectations are that they don't have fans. And, and uh, my understanding is NFL guidelines uh, also uh, provide uh, authority and remind teams that local authorities uh, have the ability to ban fans. So I don't expect any issues with Eagles. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. We're going to go to Charlene Santiago of Univision. Eh, hello, buenos días, buenas tardes. Eh, solamente una preguntita rápido. Um, para aquellos eventos que ya estaban programados, ¿tienen algún estimado de cuántos serían los que se cancelarían? Eh, ¿Esa pregunta para el alcalde o para Brian? Eh, me, lo dejo abierto para que me pueda contestar. This is a question for either Brian or Brian. Regarding the events that have been canceled, my question is for those that have been already planned and scheduled, how many are being canceled? I didn't get you. We didn't get you all. You were cutting off. At least from my, from my perspective, we were getting cut off. The question is, for the yeah. events that have already yeah. planned and have been canceled, how many events are being canceled? I'm not sure. We'll have to get back to you with a, with a specific number of events. I don't know. No tenemos estas cifras en estos momentos y vamos a tener que volver a contactarte para darte esta información. ¿Hay alguna pregunta? So, entonces no tendrían como un estimado aproximado. Do you have an approximate or an estimate or the number of events that would already have I can't get a word here. It's a, is the question, is there an estimate of the number of fans, Armando? Yes, if there are. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have an estimate. Um, I, I will say I, it's probably dozens, but we'll have to get back to get back to her with the specifics. No tengo un número estimado, pero calculamos que debe ser docenas de eventos que se van a tener que suspender. Alguna okay, pregunta? Th thank you. We're going to move to Kennedy Rose now of the Philadelphia Business Journal. Hi, I have two super quick questions. Uh, the first one is, does this moratorium apply to the Pennsylvania Convention Center or do restrictions on indoor events uh, really more apply here? Um, you, uh, the restrictions on indoor events would apply to the Convention Center. Again, th this moratorium is really meant for uh, city permitted events. Um, and those events in the Convention Center are not city permitted, um, but the restrictions on indoor events would apply. Gotcha. And um, this is either for the mayor or for you, Brian. Do you have any additional words to offer to businesses operating in the tourism and events industry who are now facing more months of closure and downturn of business? Uh, I mean, really we're, we're, hopeful, we're hopeful that, that we can continue to make progress uh, and get through this and get things back to some semblance of normal, but that will never be totally normal again. Um, but, but the thing that everybody has to understand, and we've seen it very clearly, that when you open up too fast and too recklessly, you throw it, you throw everything back uh, to almost a red phase. Um, so all the fun they were having in Florida and Texas and other places, you know, bopping around a thousand people in a pool, uh, it seemed like fun then, don't seem like much fun now. 
Uh, so I don't want to put anybody in a situation to, to, to challenge their health or to hurt them in any way medically. Uh, and I know it's hard uh, from an economic standpoint, point, but if we, if we follow the path of Florida, Texas, Arizona, and other places, uh, we'll be going back, we'll be marching into the, backwards uh, into the red phase, and that'll make things even worse than they are today. So always listen to your doctor, do what your doctor tells you, and our, and our city's doctor right now is uh, Dr. Farley, and that's what he's telling us. So, uh, and I think it's been made very, very clear and proven that if you don't listen to the medical advice, you're in trouble. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Kennedy. We're gonna go back to um, Denise Clay at the Sunday Sun. Okay, Denise, um, we'll come back to you. We're gonna go to Mike D'Onofrio of the Tribune. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, Brian, uh, you said you wanted to see an African American woman in uh, in your role. Can you tell me why? Why do you think um, Why do you think that? Um, I, th you know, I think this goes back to perspective and and the voices at the table. Look, I I recognize that you know as a white man, I have been granted privileges that uh, are unfair, uh, and I know that my daughters are going to have uh, advantages uh, that that uh, little girls their same age that live very close by aren't gonna have uh, just because of who their parents are and, and the color of their skin, and that's not fair. Uh, and I think as we traverse uh, these uh, challenging times, uh, a voice uh, of diversity uh, and uh, one uh, is really important uh, for the city's future. Uh, and uh, I, I strongly believe that. And then uh, the mayor, uh, you know, considering Brian's comments, would you commit to hiring an African-American woman in the role? We will hire the best person available. And that's what we did with the police commissioner. Uh, and she happened to be an African-American female. Um, so we will we will have a process and we will we will select the best candidate available uh, and um, we'll go from there. All right. Thanks. Okay, we're going to go to Jenny DeHuff now of Broad and Liberty. Awesome, thank you. Uh, really quick two-part question regarding the class action lawsuit filed today against the city. Um, as I understand it, when a group plans a protest, like the one on June 1st, they're required to alert the city of their route. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mayor, but didn't you say in a press conference last month that the protesters had diverted off their pre-approved route uh, onto the highway, onto 676, thus making it more difficult for police to protect them? There's not a, there's not a requirement that they tell us what their route is. It's our preference uh, to keep people safe if they tell us what their route is. Uh, there were some uh, instances during the course of the month long of protests where, um, you know, a group of 500 would be at one location, uh, would not tell us their route. There'd be a group of maybe another 500 at another location that don't tell us their route. Uh, they have um, speeches or, or things that people say uh, there, they have an event, uh, and then they start moving. If we don't know where they're moving, it's hard to block traffic so that people aren't in harm's way. It's hard to, you know, to, to keep people safe, to, to be on either side of them uh, if they're moving in different directions. Sometimes those groups would, would, would catch up together and it will become a thousand person march, a thousand person event. Uh, and they would, you know, they were going in different directions. So uh, we, our preference, it's not requirement because First Amendments do not, have, First Amendment rights do not have requirements, uh, but we, it's our preference to tell us so we can help you, uh, you know, maneuver. Uh, but when people don't want to tell us, we do our best to keep them safe as, uh, without the knowledge. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's about it. Thank you. Um, we'll go back to Chad Pradelli of 6ABC. Yeah, this, is, this question is for the mayor and from my colleague, Annie McCormick. What do you say to citizens who are questioning the strength strength of the city's leadership right now and, and now that you're losing a visible leader through a tough few months? Um, uh, we have a great group of people who are working this administration. I am not the only, just, I'm the final decision maker, but I'm not the only decision maker. Uh, and there are people throughout the government who run departments uh, and uh, run them well. Uh, and we will continue on in that regard uh, until we have a replacement 
um, at some point in time in the near future. Um, no one's irreplaceable, including myself. Um, and uh, the city has gone, I'm the 99th mayor, and the city has gone on for a long, long time uh, with people changing roles and uh, moving on. Uh, and I think we'll be fine. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna go to Pat Loeb of KYW. Pat? Thanks. I know you've talked about the search, but it will be a national search or are you? I don't, we, we don't know yet. Um, there'll be a search. There'll be a process. And do you expect it to be completed by September 1st or would there be I an don't, acting? I, I don't know. We're just, we're just getting into it right now. Okay. Thank you. It's Pat. We'll go back to Max Marin of Billy Penn. Max. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right, Brian, just out of curiosity, what do you plan on doing after you leave government? Um, you know, that's a that's a good question. You know, I'm excited about what's next, uh, although I can't tell you what that is yet. Are you going um, back to theater? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I uh, probably won't go back to theater, but you never know. Um, you know, and uh, in whatever, whatever uh, adventure that is, uh, I'm looking forward to contributing to the city uh, in the future. Uh, I, um, I love the city. It's my home. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what that next step is and looking forward to contributing in different ways. Fair enough. And are you going to be involved in the selection process at all for your replacement? Uh, I, th that's up to the mayor, but um, I certainly talk, talk We haven't talked right. about it, but certainly would seek some input. Okay. Thank you both. Thanks, Max. Our last question goes to Martin Pratt of um, Philly YBN. Hi, thanks for doing Um Brian, question. Is there any truth to the rumors? I know you just answered this question about theater. Is there any truth to rumors that you're going to join Joe Biden's campaign? Uh, it would be news to me. Okay. Uh, Dr. Farley, uh, a lot of parents, especially in West Philadelphia, are really concerned about kids going back to school. Uh, is there a possibility or any consideration to not sending uh, kids, particularly uh, as we see surges in that particular population, not back to school. And as there's a secondary plan, if cases increase amongst young people for them not going to school in September. Uh, school district is, is planning to open. Uh, you know, parents have the option to not send their children to school. And uh, my understanding, uh, you know, I'm talking to them, but they, they can learn uh, online if they have that concern. Um, and um, we certainly hope that the case rates go down from here. If we were to get a big surge, there was some possibility that we would have a broader shutdown across the city and we might shut down the entire school system. Uh, but uh, that depends entirely on what happens to the epidemic. Okay. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Martin. And that concludes our briefing for today. We will have our next COVID-19 briefing on Thursday at one o'clock. Thank you.